The Prime Minister's offer to take 150 Manus Island refugees was almost accepted yesterday after a farcical day in Australia's Parliament that saw a vote in favour of the offer, then a vote rejecting it. Australia closed down the Manus Island Detention Centre at the end of October and has refused to accept New Zealand's offer on the basis the refugees would use the opportunity as a backdoor move to Australia. But if the offer is accepted in the future, where would they end up when they arrive? Well, in the first instance, it's the Mangere Refugee Centre. And Zach Fleming and cameraman Nick Munro visited as the latest intake of 164 men, women and children prepare to move on. It's just before 2pm. PE is nearly over. A group of teenage boys is playing basketball. Half court, so two teams, but one hoop. They're competitive and loud. And they don't care that they're not very good. We filmed the last two and a half minutes of their game. Not one hoop was sunk, but they were still all goofy white grins at the end. Good game. The boys are from Colombia, Syria and Myanmar. They only met a few weeks ago and they have almost nothing in common. Except none of them will ever go back to where they were born. They are now and will forever be refugees. They're just happy to be here. They are different from migrants. They are people who have been uprooted from their homes. They, there's, there's not something that they've chosen or planned. Chamal Marathi's mother came to New Zealand as a refugee from Kosovo. As Immigration New Zealand's refugee quota branch manager, he's made helping people like her his job. Today, though, he's showing us around the Mangari Refugee Resettlement Centre, which reopened in June last year after a $25 million rebuild. Every refugee that comes to New Zealand spends six weeks here. There are up to six intakes of around 170 people each year, and they're taken here straight off the plane. They're offered medical help, both physical and mental, given the horrors most have endured to get here, and basically then start to learn about their new country. There are security cameras and the gates are locked, but that's to keep people out, not in. Everyone has their own keycard, they can leave whenever they want, and can even stay elsewhere overnight if they give notice. The first place Jamal takes us is the first place refugees come to, a big, bare, wooden-floored room reminiscent of a school hall. There's a porphyry and the refugees are invited to speak. Well, some of people will have the opportunity to talk about their past experiences for the first time openly and freely without concerns of, you know, mm. of, from the places where they've fled from yeah. and, and it, it, it's, it's quite, quite, quite a special, special day. The group of 164 currently here came from Afghanistan, Bhutan, China, Colombia, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Iran, Myanmar, Pakistan, Palestine, Somalia, Sudan and Syria. Now they have to learn to be New Zealanders, so they go to school, all of them, from preschool aged kids to... The oldest is 72 or something, wow. yeah, all the way through. Maria Hayward is the director of the education centre here. She's also a senior lecturer at AUT. AUT runs the school. Maria's tasked with running what's undoubtedly one of the most difficult curriculums in the country. Almost every one of our students speak either no English or very little English and they also speak probably one of 12 different languages in one classroom. So they can't even communicate easily with one another within the group and the medium for teaching needs to be English. So if we're teaching um, maths, for example, um, to the kids, we teach it in English to children who understand very little English. It's a full school day for everyone for all six weeks, 9am to 3pm. Maria tries to replicate the average Kiwi classroom, whatever that means, except the majority of time spent is on learning English. Then there's a bit of everything else, art, music, PE. Giving that structure to the day helps people to feel safe again. It's like returning to normal life and it's also knowing what's coming next. And that routine helps people to start to feel they're back in a normal, safe environment. It's just gone 3pm. We've been here for an hour now. School's over for the day. Next is afternoon tea. Today, it's an orange. At least half of the 164 are here to get one, old and young. 
And whoever says curiosity diminishes with age has never brought a camera into a refugee centre. The kids one by one demand to go looking through the viewfinder. One cheeky man in his 30s asks if he can film for a bit. Most people spend most of the day outside when it's good weather. When they're not outside though, they're in a mix between flatting and backpacker style accommodation. There are six blocks with four apartments in each. Inside each apartment is four bedrooms and a basic shared lounge and kitchen. Two couches and a TV in the lounge, a mini fridge and a kettle in the kitchen. The bedrooms are small but big enough to not feel claustrophobic and everyone has access to the outdoors. Upstairs apartments have balconies, downstairs there are ranch sliders onto grass. But it's the small things that make you realise a lot of thought has been put into all this. After their time here, when each refugee moves into society and their own home, they're given the same furniture they had in the centre, beds, couches, everything. Familiarity and then in continuation so they, they will be familiar. We have staff who work with families and help families in, in learning about how to use New Zealand appliances and how to, you know, cleaning agents and cleaning detergents and all these things. Yeah, how so, to turn uh, the heater on. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. All that, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. The kitchens are basic because everyone eats together. 150 people can fit in the dining hall, nearly the whole centre. The food is provided by a private catering company. Breakfast every day is porridge, cereals, stewed fruit, yoghurt and toast and spreads. Lunch, dinner and dessert changes every day. Here's a sample day. Chilli beef and bean fried rice for lunch with buffet tabbouleh and tuna rice salad if you're still hungry after that. And for dinner chicken noodle soup, chicken and lemon tagine with herb tabbouleh and steamed broccoli and a seasonal garden salad with orange. Then trifle to finish for dessert. And one night a week we have a theme evening when we bring everybody and they, they get to work together with, with our uh, cooks and then they, they, they cook their national meal. A worker I spoke to who's spent time working with refugees overseas described the centre as boutique. And it might sound weird, but I feel she's right. She compared it to America, which took 85,000 refugees last year. How could they be given the same level of care the 164 people here are given? At the end of their six weeks, it all comes full circle. Back to the school hall-esque room. They're here, back here, and you have children singing, you know, in English and in Maori, and then people sing, bring their, some of them will sing their songs from where they come from, and they, they, they will share their stories, and they... They will reflect on, the, on the, 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 the six weeks that they've spent here together. And it's, it's quite, quite special day as well. Yeah. On December the 8th, this intake will quietly slip out into New Zealand and try to live a normal life. They'll go to Auckland, Waikato, Manawatu, Wellington, Nelson and Otago. Most qualify for social housing. Immigration will do their best to make sure everyone leaves to a job. They will do their best to learn English and our customs and culture. We should do our best to include. Be welcoming, you know, to be able to say welcome to people who weren't welcomed in the country they fled to. They were living there maybe for, you know, some people up to 20 years. And then to come to a new place, it's really important that we say welcome and we mean it. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming.